OK. Um, so I'm afraid this is going to be vastly less entertaining than Don's talk, because um, I basically don't think it's the realm of psychology to talk about metaphysics. And I'm, uh, my project is a psychological one. Although, strangely enough, I actually think I'm going to end up uh, kind of aligned with Don in that, since I don't think I'm interested in talking about the real world, I don't actually want to make straight, strong claims about what's happening in the real world. So this kind of truth thing is, is uh, well, we'll talk about that probably as it, as it goes along. Um, so what I am interested in doing is kind of a, usually I, I'm, I'm a very theoretical person, but relative to this crowd, I would say I'm, I'm fairly pragmatic. Um, wh wh what I want to do is kind of a strange thing. Um, so what I essentially want to do is uh, look at, look at uh, behavior, look at thought, and you know, a combination of introspection and mostly experiments, um, and figure out some uh, mathematical principles that, if we use them, will help us explain uh, aspects of thought, and then see how we can combine them together. Um, and so uh, let me just kind of outline three observations and principles that might help us uh, work with them. The first is an observation that um, you know, the world is an uncertain place, setting aside whether there actually is a world or not. Um, and, and that kind of uncertainty intuitively is, is from two different sources. Um, not truly different, but they seem different. One is, is noise. Um, we believe that there's a lot of noise between um, the things that matter to us uh, in the world, if there's a world, and uh, our, our actual input. So this is, you know, you're driving down the highway in the, in the rain, and there's a sign there that you'd like to read, but there's all this water that's interfering with your, your observations. So you have to deal well with this. You shouldn't just say, ah, noise, drive off the road. Right? You should do something useful. Um, the second kind of uncertainty is one that I think is deeper and more interesting. So imagine that you call your best friend on the phone one day, and before you say anything, he immediately yells at you and hangs up the phone. Okay. So it could be that he wanted to hurt you. It could be that he thought you were a telemarketer. Right? <laughs> Um, so what's going on here is a case of, of an under-constrained inference, um, which is something that Don talked about nicely in the realm of perception, that you get relatively sparse input information from the world, and you're trying to reconstruct this fairly complex latent space of you know, descriptions, uh, in this case, beliefs and desires and, and so on. Um, and so you have uncertainty because there's simply not enough information in the input to reconstruct the things that you want to reconstruct. Um, now, uh, fortunately for me, um, people have thought about uh, how you can behave usefully under uncertainty. Um, and there's a, you know, a principle, set of principles for this, um, namely probability and probabilistic inference. Um, and you know, there's a lot of debate, as we've been hearing about the details of probability theory. But what's kind of compelling to me in looking at, at for instance, formal epistemology is that the, the places where the different theories of how you should behave under uncertainty deviate are you know, kind of uh, relatively corner cases. There's a vast realm where they agree. Um, and so I think for being a, a pragmatist, as I seem to be today, um, starting out by saying, OK, if we assume that uh, the mind is behaving uh, by doing, uh, you know, or as I'll say in a minute, approximating probabilistic inference, that's going to go a long ways towards explaining how the mind can do useful things despite the uncertainty in the world. OK. So that's one, one sort of set of observations. Here's some other observations. Um, so von Humboldt said, and then Chomsky made famous, that language, and by extension thought, uh, is that which makes infinite use of finite means. So thought is productive. And this kind of productivity is both kind of moment to moment. So I could, you could read this phrase in the newspaper uh, this morning, a big green bear who loves chocolate. I am pretty confident that unless you've heard this talk, you haven't thought of that sentence before. But you don't have any trouble imagining a big green bear who loves chocolate, and also imagining lots of sort of scenarios. Imagine now that that bear is in a national park where there's a car and there's a chocolate bar locked in the car. What's the bear going to do? Probably you know, try to get into the car, maybe tear the door off. Um, you know, but he'll blend into the background because he's green, and, and, and et cetera. So you have no trouble thinking of this unbounded set of different, uh, different things that you've never thought of before. You have to be able to construct these. Um, also, on a much longer time scale, culturally and developmentally, there are these concepts that we've created uh, and have to learn, like mass and momentum are concepts, or nations and congresses and senates and such things. And these are not things that are plausibly innate. These are things that we have to have constructed. 
So there's this puzzle of how could thought be so productive? How could it be such a thing that we can entertain and uh, so many thoughts and create so many new concepts when needed? Um, there's a kind of answer to that as well, mathematical answer, which is, well, if we think that thoughts uh, have compositional structure, um, so they're built up uh, out of small pieces uh, uh, fitting together like tinker toys, right? There are little pieces of thoughts that get combined together into big structures or letters or molecules built up out of atoms. That explains this productivity, right? Small set of primitive things, you can put them together into an uh, unbounded set of uh, uh, structures by just uh, the sort of combina combinatorial explosion. Okay, there's a third observation, which is uh, maybe a little bit vaguer. Um, which is that um, thinking some st seems to involve sort of simulation. And I go back and forth um, on, on this, which is the wussy version, and saying that it's imagination that's important. Somehow our thought processes seem to involve the ability to imagine. Um, so what I have in mind by this is both the kind of classic, um, you know, simulation uh, style things like mental rotation, uh, but also uh, kind of more rich real world uh, simulations. Like imagine I'm holding a hammer and I throw the hammer. You can imagine how the hammer tumbles, the kind of trajectory it follows, what happens when the hammer hits the wall, right? All of this is not something that you're doing based on an input. It's something based on a scenario I set up. You close your eyes and you can imagine that. Um, and so there's a, a kind of answer. It's a slightly less mathematical one a priori, but there's a kind of answer to what's going on there that people have suggested. And this goes back to oh, Helmholtz, Gibson, a lot of these guys, which is generative models, that what our knowledge is is uh, sort of a little internal model that lets us imagine worlds. I'm not saying whether they're the actual world or not. They're internal worlds. OK, so here's a bunch of principles. Um, interestingly, in, uh, in cognitive science, these principles rarely go together. Um, so instead, you'll often hear these discussions of, you know, is it structure or statistics? Is it prob probability or compositionality? Um, which seems completely unnecessary to me. These are mathematical principles, and the nice thing about math is that math, one piece of math is not mutually exclusive from another piece of math. You can usually combine them together to do interesting things. Um, so that's basically what, uh, what I want to tell you about. Um, we, 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 we give a name to this uh, trying to combine these things together, the probabilistic language of thought hypothesis. Um, it's kind of nice and descriptive, right? The language part uh, is conveying the compositional representation. The probabilistic part is conveying that those representations uh, are used probabilistically. It's also kind of nice and inflammatory because it reminds psychologists of Fodor who uh, drives them crazy, which is kind of fun. Um, I imagine it's less inflammatory in this audience since, uh, yeah. Okay, so what's the probabilistic language of thought hypothesis? Well, the kind of uh, uh, informal theory version of it is this, that mental representations are actually compositional. Um, what those, those representations mean is probabilistic usually used to encode generative knowledge. Um, and because of this, the, the latter parts, um, those mental representations support thinking and learning by probabilistic inference, that you can describe uh, at some level uh, our uh, reasoning processes, our re well, our reasoning competencies um, as probabilistic inferences. OK, uh, you should be holding onto your wallets here because this is pretty vague. Right. The question is, can we actually formalize this into uh, a, a system that embodies these properties, allows us to, to get concrete and, and see what it does? So that's going to be the first thing I want to show you. Um, I'm first going to talk about the stochastic lambda calculus, which uh, brings together compositionality and probability in a nice way. Um, I'm then going to kind of illustrate with sort of a toy example of reasoning with concepts using this language. Um, I'm going to talk about intuitive psychology, theory of mind. Uh, uh, hopefully, if I have time, I'll talk about um, natural language pragmatics. And then, uh, then I'm going to push down and talk about the, the actual possible algorithms and, and um, how the process of inference could unfold. OK, so let me start uh, with something that is kind of common ground for many of us, probably, uh, namely Bayes nets. So Bayes nets are a nice way of representing uh, uh, probabilities. So it's something like a, a graph here. And you take this graph, and then you have to fill in the conditional probability tables. So things like saying, hey, coughing uh, has a different probability depending on its parents, flu and TB. Um, what's nice about Bayes nets is that they give you kind of a notion of mental models of causal processes that give rise to observations. Um, no claim about realism, just that internally you have this, I'm going to stop saying this 
no claim ever about realism. Uh, you have this uh, mental model of causality that you use to decide to interpret observations, um, perhaps using the rules of probability, and uh, uh, potentially use that to decide what actions to take. Um, the, the problem with this view, the reason this isn't kind of the answer to here's the, the probabilistic language I'm looking for, um, is that there's a great uh, deal of stuff that ends up hidden inside the nodes and arrows of these Bayes nets. So in some sense, uh, Bayes nets are not nearly uh, compositional enough. They don't have very fine-grained compositionality. Um, so an example is the one that I already alluded to. Um, if you wanted to write down a, a theory of mind model uh, using Bayes nets, it would look like this kind of thing. There's beliefs, there's desires, they give rise to actions. Um, but this is, this is kind of a, a, a tragic uh, simplification. First of all, there are infinitely many different beliefs and desires. And second of all, right, so you'd have to write down an infinite by infinite by infinite contingency table um, if you uh, actually wanted to, to represent that. That doesn't seem like a, a good thing to have to do. Um, and second of all, the, the sort of functional form between beliefs, desires, and actions has a lot more structure than just an unstructured table, right? So really what we want is something where we're going to have a more fine-grained language for describing kind of the computational relationship between these things and this thing, um, even though it is probabilistic. Um, so where I turned was uh, a nice universal representation for computational processes, deterministic ones, but computational processes, namely lambda calculus. Um, and just to remind you, well, first of all, some notation. Lambda calculus is basically about making up functions and composing them together. Um, I'm going to be using the Lisp notation, um, which uh, historically, for historical reasons, the parentheses go on the outside of the operator. So instead of sine of x, it's parentheses sine x. Um, and, uh, and to avoid ambiguity, operators always go at the beginning. So no x plus y, it's always plus xy, just to warn you. Um, now, lambda calculus is beautiful because it's really simple. There's really just two things that happen in lambda calculus. The first is you make up functions. And so the lambda uh, construct basically says, I'm making a new function. The next thing is the name for the input to that function. The input is going to be one thing called x. And the thing after that is what that function does. So that's called the body. Um, the body of this function is take x, whatever it is, and add it to itself. Um, the define keyword is not necessary, but it makes it a whole lot easier to read these things. So I'm allowing myself to uh, uh, assign names to, to these functions. So that's one thing you can do in lambda calculus. And the other thing you can do is apply functions to arguments. Right? So I apply double to 3. I go stick 3 in here, and I add 3 to 3, and I get 6 at the end of the day. Um, the remarkable thing is that that's universal. Right? Um, or at least there's a thesis that that's universal, that's never been disproven, that any computation you can do, you can do with those tools. Um, and the, the power, this won't be crucial to the rest of the talk, but just so you know, the power comes from the ability to define and manipulate higher order functions. So here's a function repeat that takes in a function f, returns a new function that if you read through it basically does f twice on the input. Right? And so then I can do fun things like I can repeat double and then apply that to 3, and repeating double gives me quadruple, right? So uh, quadruple 3, you get 12. Or if I had a derivative operator, I could repeat it to get a second derivative operator. So you can do fun things like that. OK, that's deterministic. Um, how do we move to uh, something that can represent probabilities? Well, it turns out that there's a very, very simple idea, which um, if I was doing it in terms of pure lambda calculus, I would say, let's just introduce a single new construct which is a random choice operator that says um, either do this or this randomly. And otherwise, use all the normal rules of lambda calculus. Um, so I'm going to do that in the context of so, um, a probabilistic programming language called Church, named after Alonzo Church, um, which is kind of the programming language equivalent of stochastic lambda calculus, the same way Lisp is a programming language built on lambda calculus. It's prettier to write things down in. Um, OK, so what happens? Well, we've introduced this additional operator flip, um, which flips a coin, in this case, a coin with uh, weight 0.3. And so if we just do what this, this little piece of a program says, we flip a coin, we get heads, which I'm writing as 1, and assign that to A. We get uh, flip the coin, we get 0 for B, flip the coin, we get 1 for C. And then we add the three of them up, and we get 2. Okay. What's interesting about this not at all surprising, but interesting is that if we did it again, we'd get a different answer. Right? We do it again, we get 0. We do it again, we get 1. And now you can imagine doing this over and over and over again, right? and then making the histogram of the answers that you got out. Histogram is going to look something like this. Okay? So 
Asymptotically, this approaches some, some histogram which adds up to one because you have to distribute your, your counts. Oh, you have to normalize it. Um, and so basically, this is a probability distribution, right? Um, and over here, you could imagine figuring out the mathematical form that says, what's the probability of one and so on? And so then you get the sort of standard probability notation, something like that, right? What's interesting here is that over there, we have basically a set of instructions for sampling a random value. And I've just basically kind of informally convinced you that that induces a probability distribution, right? So on the left, we have what I like to think of as the sampling semantics. And on the right, we have this distribution semantics. Um, and it turns out that those are, are actually equivalent in the sense that um, any, uh, well, with a halting restriction, any uh, program uh, in that stochastic lambda calculus or in church induces a distribution on return values. But more interestingly, the, the converse is true as well, that any computable distribution can rep be represented non-uniquely uh, by a church expression, right? So that's really cool because what that says, those are, are equivalent. And so what that says, if we want to work with probabilities, we can actually always work over there actually with these sampling procedures. We don't ever have to think directly about the, the um, the probability mathematics if we don't want to. Um, and why is that useful? Well, it's because in the sampling semantics, composition is incredibly straightforward. Composition is ordinary function composition. You have two functions, random functions. You run the first one and get a particular output because it samples an output. And then you just stick that into the second one and run that one and get another uh, particular output, right? The equivalent thing over here basically involves a big integral, a marginalization. Um, and that big integral doesn't have a closed form, so it's very hard to work with. So compositionality is, is kind of trivial and straightforward over there, and that's why I, I like this system. I, the, the range of that left-hand function is just the, the non-negative integers. Uh, yeah, in this case. Could you clarify what the domain is? Um, so the left-hand function, well, uh, there's, there's no range exactly, right? The range is I start with nothing, and in the end I get a number, which is an integer. The range is the Right oh, oh, um, you mean? Classic domain range terminology. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah. from what to those ones and twos? You mean over here? Yeah. So it's not a mapping from anything to the, to the ones and twos, right? It's a, it's a process, so it's a computation that you run, and at the end of the day, you have uh, the return value of that computation, right? So I shouldn't think of it as a domain to range function. No, so, so that's what it looks like over here. And the point is that over there, it, uh, there's sort of this different view, equivalent view, of the semantics where you should really think of it as a random computation you run that has, there's a type to the output, right? So there's a domain, but not a range in the same sense. So the parentheses mean something different. The parentheses mean something different, okay. yeah. Um, effectively, um, you can think of the relationship as a function over here as a, as a stochastic function so that uh, it goes from something to a uh, distribution on outputs as opposed to a particular output. Yeah. There's a f you can formalize that fairly nicely. Okay. Question? Is this somehow different from Lisp? Um, so over here, so far, what I've said looks like Lisp, except I'm, you know, in Lisp, you could just take Lisp and add a random thing, right? The thing is that the random thing doesn't have uh, proper grounding into the semantics. So what I'm doing is sort of taking this more seriously at the level of the semantics of the language and observing that when you do that, you actually get something which is a, a sort of universal representation for probability distributions. It's going to get more interesting in, when I press the next button, because then we're going to start talking about inferences that you make from these. Yeah. This is why I'm saying like the basic move that we make is this really trivial, simple move. But it has these profound consequences of giving us a compositional language for probabilities so that we can stop thinking about these things and start thinking about those things. And that we're justified doing that. Okay, doc. Um, so um, when we deal with probabilities, we don't usually want to just declare a probability distribution. We want to ask questions of that probability distribution. Um, and so we have a special syntax for asking questions uh, that we call query, because hey, querying the, the model. Um, and it's basically a syntax that corresponds to conditional probability, uh, conditional inference. Um, and so basically, the way it looks is you have some definitions uh, to specify a model. Um, so we make that explicit. Um, and then you have the thing you want to know the answer to. You're going to get a sampled value from that query expression. And finally, the conditioning expression, you're conditioning on this expression evaluating to true. Okay. So here you say, what's A plus B plus C, assuming that A plus B is 1, 
Um, and in this case, you'd get a conditional distribution that looks something like this. Um, now, a, a side point that uh, I, I won't go into details, but it's kind of cool to note is that in normal probability theory and Bayes nets, you think of querying uh, the conditional uh, inference as something outside of the Bayes net language that happens to Bayes nets. Um, stochastic lambda calculus is actually rich enough that you can define the query operator directly in the language by using a stochastic recursion. And so that's why I didn't bother to talk about it as an extra semantic piece. Um, in terms of efficiency, that's not the, the best way to deal with query, but just in terms of semantics, you can go ahead and do that definition, which is really nice. And I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to exploit the fact that query is an ordinary function in this language uh, in a few slides in order to be able to handle uh, social cognition, think reasoning about reasoning. All right, so uh, that's, the, that's the kind of uh, mathematical infrastructure. Um, with that in hand, I can go and I can kind of give you a more technical, a more precise version of this, this crazy hypothesis I have. Um, we could say that the probabilistic language of thought hypothesis really is something more specific. It's saying that mental representations or AKA concepts are functions, um, and when I say R, I don't mean in the neural sense, I mean in the, the, the uh, computational level analysis sense, in a stochastic lambda calculus like Church. So we, we should see how far we can get by thinking of the pieces of thoughts as stochastic functions that compose together in this way. Um, a couple of, of points to make about what this is saying and not saying. The first is that so far, um, and in the first bulk of this talk, I'm talking about uh, the inferences that are licensed by particular probabilistic representations, and I'm separating that from the actual process of inference, right? So in terms of Mars levels, this is a, a computational level uh, thing. Um, I'm not making any claims about rational, rational analysis here, right? So it's not quite at that full, you know, response to the environment level, um, but it's also not about the process. I will hopefully get a chance to talk about the process of inference, um, and the, the view I'm gonna have is that those inference processes approximate the, in, the inferences that are described here, these probabilistic inferences. They sometimes do it well and sometimes do it badly, and critically, they do it under resource constraints. So right now, we're really interested in studying kind of from a, an engineering probabilistic AI point of view, what happens when you do resource rational inference, um, and hopefully I'll get a chance to talk about that towards the end. All right, so um, now let's see this actually do something. So I wanna talk a little bit about reasoning. Um, and first, let me talk about reasoning, the kind of thing that psychologists have mostly studied, but I'm quickly going to abandon that and do what I think is more interesting common sense reasoning. So psychologists uh, look at things like these syllogisms, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, or most A's are B's, most B's are C's, therefore most A's are C's, or an even longer version of that. Um, and the thing to note about this is that this seems true, this seems relatively true, this seems less true. Logically speaking, that's true, and these are both not true, right? Um, and so the question is, is there a simple way to use the stochastic lambda calculus such that you, you recover the truth of this thing, but you also recover the fact that these two things feel sort of plausible, although differentially plausible? Um, so the approach is basically you say, okay, there's this, I'm looking at these, this sort of case of mosts. There's these three predicates, each of which is basically just a random property of its input. Um, this uh, reasoning argument I just encode by saying, I want to know whether most A's are C's, assuming that most A's are B's and most B's are C's. So I just translated it into this query syntax. Um, and then to, to finish this, I have to tell you what most means. So I just make a little definition of most, which is the linguist standard definition. Most X's or Y's means that more than half of the X's are Y's, uh, I think. Yeah, that's basically what that says. Now, if I do the probabilistic inference that is sort of instructed here, um, under no additional uh, assumptions, what I find is, you know, this kind of nice thing that, sure enough, um, the conclusion follows every time for this one that's logically true. So we recover the kind of, uh, in this case, first order logic um, that, you, that you'd like to recover. Um, but in addition, we have, you know, a degree of probability for the others, and the more plausible one is, in fact, more likely, and the less plausible one is less likely. Um, so we get graded judgments because we're doing probabilistic inference, but there's still some connection to the log logical content of these things. And that's the sense in which I'm kind of uh, you know, optimistic that this is a system that lets us uh, generalize uh, kind of uh, a lot of the infrastructure from logic and programming language, languages, but do it in a way that, that kind of makes sense of the, the graded judgments that people give. 
Um, so I could go and talk a lot more about reasoning stuff, but I, I decided to collapse that part of the talk um, and instead move on to slightly more complex reasoning. Still not, um, well, okay, slightly more complex. So you all have probably played tug of war. Tug of war is this game where there's two teams on either end of a rope and they pull and the, they, they're trying to pull the other team across a line. So what I'm going to do is just kind of use introspection to list out some of the concepts that you need or that you would use for thinking about tug of war and then write them down as a church program um, and then essentially explore the inferences that you do there. So there's concepts like strength, which is a, which is a kind of continuous magnitude. Um, each person has some intrinsic strength, but in addition, there's this laziness. Each person might or might not be lazy at any given match or moment. Um, that matters because that tells you how hard, how much pulling force they actually are exerting. Um, of course, you need to know that there are teams of people, not just individuals. Um, and uh, critically, what you care about is that um, there's a winner of a match. A match is a, a thing between two teams that has a winner. Okay, so if we take that set of concepts, the first thing we're going to do is basically say, look, strength is just a function of a person and it's a random function, a random draw from some Gaussian. Um, I use this little mem operator that I haven't told you about. So this is memoization in the computer science sense. It basically says the first time you ask about a particular person, you do this random draw, but then you store it and every time after that you just look up. So that makes it a persistent strength, right? Strength is a persistent property of a person that's the same each time you ask. Um, in contrast, laziness, I want not to be persistent. I want that to change on different matches. So that's just a, a function of a person that's just a random flip a coin and sometimes they're lazy. Um, and those two things matter uh, because on a particular match, I try to look up whether a person, how hard a person is pulling. To do that, I first see if they're lazy. And if they're lazy, they pull with half their strength. Otherwise, they pull with their whole strength. This is a simplification, but it's sort of a kind of, a, you know, capturing some key things about our ideas about laziness, strength, pulling, and so on. Um, the total pulling of the team is basically a linear combination of how hard each person on the team is pulling. So map is this nice little higher order thing that applies pulling to every element of that set team. And then I sum those up. So it's really just the linear combination of how hard each person is pulling. And then the winner is the team that pulls harder. So the winner between team one and team two, I look at how much that team is pulling and how much that team is pulling, and I compare them. And then one of those teams wins. Okay. Um, so what we can do now that we have this, so you can think about this as basically a, a dictionary or a lexicon of concepts that we have, right? Each of these functions is a concept, but because they're compositional functions, we can combine them together in different ways to capture different patterns of evidence and critically different questions that we want to ask, right? So this, uh, this single set of, you know, fairly small set of concepts is going to support lots and lots and lots and lots of different inferences. It's extremely productive in that sense, which I just gave away part of the punchline for this section. That's okay. So we can ask questions like this. Imagine that Bob and Mary won against Tom and Sue, and also that Bob and Bev won against Jane and Jim. How, how strong do you think Bob is? And you can imagine changing the pattern of evidence. Um, what if instead of Bob and Mary the first time and Bob and Bev the second time, it was Bob and Mary both times? Now all of a sudden you might have a slightly weaker sense that Bob is strong, because maybe it was Mary who was the strong one, right? Um, so Toby Gerstenberg and I, figured, I, I used to use this as just a thought experiment, but Toby Gerstenberg and I said, hey, we're psychologists, let's go measure this. So we set up these situations of exactly like that. There are these tournaments that have either one or, or multiple players uh, in each uh, match, and then there's a winner, uh, one of the teams wins. And then we ask uh, subjects uh, about a particular player, how strong do they think that player is. Um, and the results kind of blew my socks off. Um, so we did this uh, across 20 different uh, conditions. Um, and I'm showing you the model predictions against the empirical means. Um, and the result is that even this simple model is actually capturing, uh, I guess, the majority of the variance of how people reason about this situation, um, at least when these are the only things that I, I present to them and ask to them. So, um, you know, we're actually doing pretty good at capturing something about how people are reasoning with these sort of concepts. Um, what's cool about this system is that you're not restricted to this kind of simple set uh, language of just you observe the outcome of matches, right? There's lots of other things you can observe and you're free to mix those however you want. So for instance, I could say, what if Bob and Mary beat Tom and Sue and I happen to also know that Bob was being lazy, right? That changes my inferences about Bob's strength a lot, right? Um, so we, we did that experiment too. Um, we had this dorky little omniscient narrator who would sometimes provide side information. 
I mean, it turns out that the, the way the model suggests you should incorporate that information matches quite well what people are doing when we give them that information. Yeah, question? What, what's on the ordinance? Um, so we have model predictions against the empirical means. What are those numbers? What do they mean? Uh, for the model predictions? Um, so we, we z-scored the probabilities here, and we z-scored uh, the <coughs> empirical means that people gave. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, z-scoring, uh, well, first of all, it's kind of a standard thing to do, and it basically um, gets rid of the fact that different subjects use, we, we give them a strength rating scale, this little slider, and different subjects just use it quite differently. Some of them like, just like the upper end. Sure. So we, we want to detrend that. Yeah. Um, good question. I should have put z-score on there. Okay. Um, and now you can imagine how this goes. This is the end of data for this, but you can imagine now we have this kind of productive system where we can start asking all sorts of different questions, right? We can say things like, Bob and Mary beat Tom and Sue, and hey, also you know that Tom, you already know that Tom is stronger than Bob. So then what's your conclusion about the strength of Bob? Um, or for instance, um, uh, you could ask a more complex question, like assuming that, um, how likely do you think it is that either Bob was lazy or Mary is stronger than Sue? So what we're seeing is that this fairly small set of concepts leads to a really large set of potential inferences. Um, the, yeah. I think Estes did a bunch of these studies about you know team A beats team B, team B beats team C, and then you get team A and C, and you collected a large data set. I think 1976 mm -hmm. found some interesting results. Did you try? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if you applied your model to that data set, but you might want to take a look at. Yeah, this is the. He has a model, and you might want to. Models sure, yeah. Th uh, this is the folding stuff? Uh, There's an SD Psych Review paper on, on probability learning. I can't remember the exact title. Well, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later and see if it's the same one I'm thinking of. The one I'm thinking of is, is different for kind of data. It's about whole teams, right? So it, it doesn't have the sort of substructure of the players on the team. Yeah, yeah. It's just about um, whole teams. Yeah, yeah. So you could do the same thing, yeah. Um, we, we actually they, haven't applied it to that yet. Malcolm Bauer did a lot of interesting experiments looking at base rates on predicting prediction, mm -hmm. and then they had a, they had a simple connectionist model mm -hmm. for predicting if, mm -hmm. I don't know if they so, ever tried to So model. part of what's interesting about this, as opposed to the connectionist model, is you'll notice that nowhere in the model specification did I say how many teams there were or who was on the teams or you know what players there were, right? So in some sense, the point I'm making here is a point about the productivity, that you have this simple compact specification that automatically tells you what to do if you would encounter new teams, new people, and things like that. The, you can write down, a, uh, for a particular situation, you can write down a Bayesnet or a connectionist model that does that, but you don't know how to extend it, right? So this is kind of like the more abstract meta information that describes how you would want to construct the, the kind of specific inference for a, a specific uh, situation that you encounter. Um, but I agree, all of that is, is of course, uh, relevant to the, the psychology here. Um, Oh, by the way, a fun thing I learned a month or two ago, that model that I wrote down for uh, estimating the strength of players, um, it turns out that Microsoft Research invented an almost identical model about five years ago that they call TrueSkill, which is actually um, in deployment in the Xbox unit, has been for three or four years at like massive scale, like you know, thousands of players a day. Um, they use it to estimate the strength of players so that they can match them up so that uh, you get sort of good matches when you go play Xbox. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of an awesome convergence of things. And also it means that not only are they doing something which seems to work for them business-wise, it's actually how people estimate strength. Right? Yeah. Um, okay. But what's the, what's the kind of uh, point about this? Why am I saying all of this? Well, it's basically to illustrate that the compositionality that you get uh, is enough to sort of say, hey, we have this kind of productive space, large space of inferences where we can compose the, the concepts together to ask various questions, flexibly expand to new people in the domain. Um, but we also need to be doing this uh, sort of in some probabilistic way in order to account for the gradedness uh, of people's judgments. Um, what I want to show you next is scaling up in just uh, you know, one kind of example domain of how this extends to more uh, to richer things. Um, so we've looked at various things like uh, agency and physics and language or intuitive concepts of, of those things. Um, and what I want to talk about is just uh, agency, intuitive psychology. Okay. Um, good. So let's start with a thought experiment. Uh, so your friend Bob has a box, this box here. Um, it's his favorite toy, though you've never seen it before. 
And one day he brings it in and puts it on his desk and he presses the two buttons on the top and the light goes on. So the question for you is a simple causal uh, inference question. How do you think the box works? Could be that pressing button A makes the light go on but not B. Could be that pressing button B does it. Could be that either A or B would be sufficient to make the light go on. It could be that you need to press both A and B uh, together to make the light go on or no relation. Now, usually I get very reliable results when I ask this, but I'm a little bit nervous in this crowd. Uh, how many, how many, I mean, you guys don't even believe in the external world, so. You know? <laughs> uh, how many people think it's this causal structure? Can you choose more than one? No. <laughs> uh, or yes, but you have to weight them. You can, you, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a hundred pennies and you can divide them up. That's how we did the experiment. How, about, how many people think this one? This one? Uh, the disjunction? Uh, a couple of people, the conjunction? Uh, okay, and no relation. Okay, so um, here there was uh, a few more people on, on conjunction than disjunction, although I will say uh, usually it's much more skewed. People usually pretty strongly favor this one, and I'll show you empirical data in, in a few slides on this. Um, so the reason that this is interesting is because we could imagine applying a, a fairly standard model of causal learning uh, to this. Um, it doesn't matter very much which standard model you get, although the one I'm going to write down is a sketch of the, the Griffiths and Tenenbaum 2005 uh, causal induction model, uh, causal support model. Um, so basically what this is saying is, look, there's some causal structure for the world, for the box, that comes from some prior uh, distribution. Uh, some actions are taken, and we don't try to explain those. Those are uniform. Um, and then there's an outcome which comes from seeing what that world causal structure uh, says, given the state the world is in and the action that was taken. Um, and then what we're trying to do is infer the world causal structure uh, under the assumption of our observations that you, uh, you press button A, press button B, and the light went on. Okay. Um, so this is basically just a standard, you know, it's a probabilistic version of a standard causal learning model. Um, and it does what uh, the kind of prescription should be from almost any uh, causal theory of causal learning, which is you shouldn't draw any strong inferences here because it was confounded evidence, right? Um, I pressed the two buttons at the same time and then there was a, a, an effect, but I don't know, I can't determine what was the cause of the effect unless I deconfound, um, so I need to do another experiment, so Popper would be happy. Um, so this predicts weak. There's a very slight boost for the, the disjunction here, basically because of the way the prior works in this case, but not due to anything about the evidence itself. So essentially flat inferences. Um, this is uh, a little bit puzzling given the experimental data, which I haven't actually shown you, but I will in a moment, which suggests that there's actually, you know, quite strong uh, preference for A and B. Um, and so we uh, decided to go on the basis, basically, of debriefing from our first version of this experiment and uh, see whether we could extend this model by taking into account the reason that Bob took those actions, right? So we're going to add a social cognition component to this causal learning model. Um, to do that, we need to formalize the relationship between beliefs, desires, and actions. Um, and essentially what we're going to do is to, to take a softmax rational action uh, assumption about how people decide what to do. Um, we can do that. There's a cool little thing that the planning is inference transformation that says, actually, we can encode that as an inference. Um, and what this says is when somebody goes to decide what to do given the causal model and the goal that they're trying to achieve, they're basically doing an inference, which is what action should I take assuming that my goal will be satisfied? So this says, see what's going to happen to the world given I take that action, see whether my goal is satisfied, condition on that. Okay. Um, there's a little bit of math to do, but it turns out that that's equivalent to a, a softmax or Boltzmann policy uh, rational action. Uh, uh, so it's uh, proportional to e to the expected utility, where utility is just whether or not the goal is satisfied. Um, okay, so what's neat, so first of all, let me, let me point out something that's probably kind of uh, slipping by here, which is that um, I'm doing a conditional inference, right, embedded inside a stochastic function, right? That's something that wouldn't make any sense if query weren't an ordinary stochastic function, if it were a thing that you had to do to an entire model. So I'm basically making up a model of decision making by embedding uh, conditional inference, uh, conditional probability inside um, this, this rational decision making function. Um, what's cool about that is that now I can go take this decision-making function and compose it together with other things and then do bigger inferences that, that are over that. So in particular, what I'm going to do is I'm first going to say, let's modify this causal learning model 
by assuming that the actions are not just from who knows where, but they actually come from Bob deciding what to do. Um, and then I'm going to make one other assumption, which is that Bob actually knows how the box works. Um, I told you it was his favorite toy, so this was pretty plausible in, in, uh, when I talked to you guys. Um, you can, of course, experimentally manipulate that. But for now, I'm assuming that the causal structure that Bob believes in is actually the causal structure of the box of the world. OK, and now I can do uh, a joint inference over this whole thing. And I can ask, OK, given the, the uh, evidence, what's the most plausible causal structure? Or what's the distribution over causal structures? Um, and what I find is this. It's a very different inference, right? It says um, that actually, from that evidence, um, you're reasonably justified in thinking that it's the conjunctive causal structure. Um, what's going on here? Well, um, to anthropomorphize the model quite a bit, it's essentially trying to explain why Bob would bother to take those actions. And it's saying, well, look, he knows how the box works. And so unless he thought that he needed to take those actions to achieve his goal, he wouldn't have taken them. So he took the two. And so if his goal is to make the light go on, then he must think the causal structure is the conjunctive one. And then if you marginalize out across the possible goals, you find that um, that is by far the most likely scenario. And so probably, in fact, he thinks that it's the conjunctive structure. And if he's right about the causal structure, then you should, you're justified in thinking that that's the causal structure. Right? So the joint inference takes care of all of that. But that's essentially what happens. Um, and again, I'll, I'll point out that doing a query over this model is doing a query that has, as a subpiece of it, a query inside this decision making. So we really needed that, that property that we can treat uh, conditional probability, conditional inference as an ordinary stochastic function so that we could construct this nested query kind of structure. Um, OK, so uh, we did this experiment. Um, we went and uh, asked subjects a bunch of scenarios for judgments in a bunch of scenarios that were parallel uh, to the Bob's box. So this is a genetically engineered plant nursery. Um, and in the first version of this, oh, uh, and our dependent measure here, although we've done it both ways, was actually the betting measure. See, they didn't have to choose one. So we gave them $100 and asked them to distribute it uh, over the different options, um, whether they actually think of this as sort of rational betting is sort of beside the point. They, they have a, it's a behavioral measure. Um, and critically, we have a control condition here. And in this experiment, we just remove the agent altogether to test the, the hypothesis of the model that it's really a social cognition thing that's going on and driving uh, inferences. So we make there be a, a physical explanation. There's a small earthquake that knocks over these two vials of liquid into the plant. OK. Um, and we did this across a bunch of different domains to make sure that it wasn't something sort of specific to machines. And the results are that, sure enough, uh, we get, and I'll go ahead and just pop it up, we get a, a very strong uh, inference at the population level, at least, that um, it's the conjunctive structure in the social condition, but not in the equivalent uh, physical condition. It goes away there, right? which um, supports. I'm not going to show you the quantitative comparison between model and data in this case, because there are a couple of free parameters, so it's not justified. But the qualitative effect, which is that you have much stronger inferences than you're justified in drawing if you just think about this as causality, uh, causal learning, not this combined causal and social thing. Um, that, that's, uh, that prediction works out quite well. Um, in case you're worried about taking the agent out altogether, we also did an experiment where it was the intentional condition versus an unintentional condition. So the, you know, Bob accidentally leans on the box while he's reaching for something. And um, we get a similar, a similar effect there. OK, um, so the point of this is basically that we can use these tools in order to uh, represent common sense knowledge, in this case, common sense knowledge about how people behave. Um, and combine them together in a kind of coherent way to do these joint inferences. Um, so the, the beauty of having this more compositional system is basically, you know, in some sense, what I'm doing is, uh, you know, pretty simple probable, well, not simple, but straightforward probabilistic things. Um, but um, having the ability to take the components and compose them together to build bigger knowledge structures that you can do inference over from, from small pieces is a really useful and powerful thing. Right? Um, so that's the kind of the, the point I'm trying to, to make um, by illustrating this uh, social cognition domain. Um, and am I supposed to go for 50 minutes or an hour? 50, 50, OK, good. So I have seven minutes. So let me very quickly tell you something about natural language communication. I'll go over this fast, so don't bother with the details. Um, 
I just want to give you the idea that the same set of ideas actually extends to explain natural language pragmatics, which is something I'm really excited about these days. Um, so communication is a, is a situation where people say some words and you, you interpret them. A, a listener interprets them. So if, if that guy says some of the apples are red, you are going to interpret that as maybe something like that. Some but not all of the apples are red. Which is interesting because that's a richer, a more strict interpretation than the literal meaning of some of the apples are red. Um, which is just some and possibly all of them. So we're going to treat this again as a, a social cognition modeling example where now the actions are utterances. Um, each utterance is going to correspond to a, a literal meaning, which is just a predicate on states of the world, essentially. Um, and we're going to uh, use the same tools to encode uh, this pair of goals that uh, the speaker wants to convey some information about the world to the listener, and the listener wants to figure out what the world is like, given that evidence. Okay. Um, so uh, the first step is uh, defining a literal listener. And the basic idea here is, is a kind of language design claim, which is that the way words work is to update beliefs from prior beliefs to posterior beliefs. So basically, sentences are conditions on possible worlds. So they, you can condition your prior, distribution, uh, prior belief distribution on the sentence you hear and get an updated posterior distribution. So we can encode that with this simple little, uh, little piece of church code that says, given whatever your theory is about how the world works, you condition on uh, the meaning of the words being true, where meaning is a mapping from English into the language of thought. Um, and then you figure out what the world looks like. Um, w one subtlety is that because we want worlds to be potentially large, unbounded things, we don't directly represent a belief distribution over worlds, but we do uh, a distribution from questions to, dis to their answers, distributions over answers. So this question under discussion thing comes in as kind of a way to parameterize these very large spaces. That's a technical detail that's not very important, actually. So um, the next step is to say, OK, if a speaker is trying to choose sort of approximately rationally the thing to say, given that they want the listener to come up with the right inference, you can represent this as the speaker tries to infer what words to say, assuming that when the literal listener hears those words, they'll come up with the desired value about the question that we're talking about, the question under discussion. So this is just saying, speaker, say what you need to say in order to get the listener, the literal listener, to have the right beliefs. Okay. Um, we can sort of keep going on this route, and we can say, well, but then there's this reflective listener who knows that about speakers. right? And the reflective listener basically is doing the thing where they say, OK, I want to know what the world is like. What's the value for the question under discussion? Assuming that if the speaker were trying to communicate that value, they would have said those words. Okay. You could keep going like this, um, and then it becomes similar to something to a kind of game theory setup. I empirically, we found that additional recursion beyond this level doesn't help uh, explain the data. It makes it worse. But it's, I want to flag that because it's definitely still an open question uh, whether you should do deeper recursion for, for this sort of thing. OK, so there's a model. And this is now a model of a reflective, of a pragmatic listener who's trying to kind of think about the speaker in interpreting uh, some words. Um, we could fill in for this particular scenario the little pieces we need, the, the bits of knowledge and the, the literal meaning. I won't go through that. Um, and uh, the, the base prediction we get is uh, what's called the scalar implicature, that if you hear if there are three apples in the world and you hear some of the apples are red, you should think that it could be one or two of them, but not all of them are red. Right? So you get this enriched meaning. Um, we fancied this up a little in, um, by assuming that the speaker has uh, partial knowledge of the situation, and the listener knows that. Um, and then we can extend the model. I don't want to go into that because of time constraints. What's cool is that the prediction is, in a complete knowledge situation, you get the scalar implicature. But in a partial knowledge situation, you should get a canceled implicature. That should, that you shouldn't draw this strong implicature. Um, and so we did an experiment. And the results of the experiment are, sure enough, um, it matters a great deal what knowledge the speaker has when they make that utterance. Uh, in determining the interpretation of the utterance. You get the, the implicature goes away in these partial knowledge cases. Um, we also did this in addition to quantifiers. We did this for numbers that have a very similar effect. Um, and then, sorry, I know I'm flipping through this quickly so I can get to the, the high level point. Um, we, we can fit the model to this data 
Um, because we measured a bunch of information about subjective priors per uh, and such per individual, we end up with a, a model that only has two parameters for the whole data set, both experiments. And it turns out that after fitting those two parameters, we, we get a very good correlation. Um, so this kind of quantitative, I'm reasoning about you, reasoning about me model is actually quite good at explaining the, the quantitative details of people's language understanding in this sort of situation. Um, uh, we've also done it for some other situations. Um, so there are these kind of simple reference games where we're trying to communicate in a concrete situation. Um, someone uses a word, the word blue to refer to one of these objects. Which one do you think they're talking about? Um, and Mike Frank and I did this for a uh, kind of systematic set of all of the different contexts. Um, and this is just showing you the, the sort of model versus human prediction. So um, point is, we have this kind of nice, now fairly generative view of natural language understanding that we can apply to lots and lots of specific uh, uh, situations and uh, uh, content, natural language content. Um, and it all comes because we have compositionality. Yay, compositionality. OK, I'm supposed to stop now, but let me just tell you the kind of high level point about inference, because I think this is important in the, the context of this workshop. Um, so inference is, uh, as I've been describing it, there's just this thing which is basically prescribed by the, you know, the laws of probability at least the standard laws of probability, which says, here's the inference you should draw given this knowledge about the world that I encode in the, 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 the set of functions and this question, this query. Um, actually implementing that inference is very tricky because those inferences very quickly become completely intractable if you were to actually try to you know, compute out, do the, the sort of arithmetic to enumerate all of the states and compute their probabilities and do the normalization. Um, so fortunately for us, there are other ways to implement these things. Um, and in particular, you know, there's sort of a convergence between the engineering that works in computer science in probabilistic AI um, and the, the kind of underlying quality of the semantics I've been talking about. Namely, the sampling semantics suggests that maybe using sample-based inference algorithms that approximate the, the probabilistic inference is a useful thing to do. And actually, those kind of inference algorithms are, are extremely powerful, extremely useful in an engineering sense. So that basically leads us to want to think, are those actually plausible as mental sort of, you know, as actual mental processing uh, hypotheses? Um, right. The short version of this is that the standard sampling algorithm, uh, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, um, basically looks like a diffusive random walk over the space of states, which happens to be biased in just the right way so that you visit states in proportion to their posterior probability. How you construct that is some awesome mathematical magic. But the, quali the qualitative behavior, right, it's not at all like enumerating the states, computing their probability, and you know, calculating the probabilities. It's this run a system that has the right uh, random walk behavior, see what that random walk behavior looks like uh, on average, and make your judgments based on that. Um, all right, I'm supposed to stop. So let me just say, the thing that we're doing that I think ties to Don's uh, uh, sort of what Don, Don demonstrated nicely is asking, OK, how does that picture change when you impose resource constraints? What's the best way to use a machine that does this sort of sampling, diffusive random walk, if you don't have arbitrary amounts of computation and time to do it in? Um, and the result, to summarize the result, it's quite interesting. It's that, first of all, you shouldn't bother to take a lot of samples. One is usually enough. So you end up with something that looks kind of like probability matching behavior. And second of all, you shouldn't even bother to take unbiased samples. Just getting uh, a little way into your Markov chain is good enough. Um, and so that ends up looking a lot like anchoring and adjustment. And we have a recent NIPS paper arguing that. So the end. <laughs> <laughs> something that the experimenter has to do. So you mean the mapping from the, the surface form of English to the, what I said was the language yeah, of thought? Yeah, like an experiment, yeah. you would have an English mind. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I went past this because I didn't have time. The, basically, the idea is you, you, know, you, you can write a model of uh, you know, language, basically, of parsing, right? Phonology, parsing, and all of that. And so 
Um, the simplest version, but then you can soup it up, is to say, let's assume that parsing has been done. You have a parse tree. Let's assume that you have a lexicon, which for every word looks up an expression in church, in the probabilistic language of thought, right? And then you compose them together just along the parse tree, right? Um, then what you end up with at the end is uh, you know, a large expression in church, which corresponds to the meaning of that sentence. Um, and the slide I slip, skipped past was sort of showing that for the case of these quantifiers. Um, there's still a lot of interesting stuff because you, you don't actually necessarily want to assume that some module is doing parsing, but you can get away with that kind of thing, right? Um, and so the key thing is, is you know, the, the, the structure of natural language is still there and still important. And it's you know, especially important to have this lexicon that goes from English words to their mentalese equivalent, right? Um, so this is kind of standard linguistics ideas. I'm just adding probabilities into the semantics and seeing what we get from it. Um, yeah. Within your scheme, do uh, people interpret some, of, some apples are red and not all apples are green as equivalent? Um, I think the answer is no, but I shouldn't say that confidently until I sit down and think it through. Um, they're logically equivalent, but the thing is, uh, depending a little bit on your treatment of negation, yeah. um, the interaction with the prior distribution over things in the world might not actually be uh, symmetric. Um, let me get back to you on it. Yeah. Um, certainly, you could imagine versions of the semantics that it doesn't so end up being equivalent. Somehow intuitively, you want to say no. I, I kind of agree with that. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting suggestion. Jerry. Yeah, so this example, some apples are red, it reminds me of a problem that comes up in decision making a lot and brings up the whole notion of subjective probability in decision making. I was just talking to Mark and Sheen about this stuff earlier this morning, but there's something <coughs> called the Ellsberg paradox. You're familiar with the Ellsberg mm -hmm. paradox. Mm -hmm. So there you told, you know, you get 33 red models and, the, and there's 99 altogether. You get 33 red models and the rest are, are green and blue. You don't know. So mm -hmm. your, your program should give you pro posterior probability distribution mm -hmm. for that kind of mm -hmm. scenario. Mm -hmm. But then the, the, post, well, the probability that you would infer from the choices people make reverse depending upon the payoffs of the reason. Mm -hmm. So you got some kind of yeah. Yeah, conflict so here because your probabilities don't depend upon the actions and the payoffs. Um, I, I would say actually that the, that's not the, the source of the, the issue. So, so I agree that given what I said, particularly at the, the high computational level, th there's not an explanation for the Ellsberg paradox, right? So a student and I thought about this very briefly a few hours one day. And I mean, to me, Part of what I tried to say in the 30 seconds that I spent on this last section where, you know, there's additional stuff that happens when you push to the process level and especially when you take into account resource constraints. Um, and, and so to me, it's reasonably plausible that part of what's going on with the Ellsberg paradox is the sort of differential resource constraints in thinking about states of the world versus y your own actions. I, I have nothing to back that up, right? Um, so, but I just want to say that, like, I think um, it's an interesting question, and um, you know, I think maybe the most interesting question for me is whether the right sort of explanation mm -hmm. is in the Ellsberg paradox, we don't have a, the right conception of the utilities involved, or that we have the right conception of the ultimate utilities, but that due to resource constraints, the way that people carry out the computation differs. In, I don't well, know. It, it turns out, I mean, Mark knows more about this than me, but uh, they, use a, they use a non additive probability theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so that's an effective description of some subset of the data. The question is, like, how does that connect to the, the kind of psychological uh, model, right? It obviously doesn't directly connect. Um, and, you know, I, I guess a latent question. So everybody in this room is curious about non-standard probabilities, quantum or other forms. You know, there's nothing in what I said. You know, I'm basically laying out what happens when you take standard probability um, marry it with uh, compositional system logic and, and you know, use it as a representation tool. There's nothing that says you couldn't try to play the same games with non-standard probabilities. Um, it's just not clear to me yet where the payoff is, whether it's justified and whether there are ways to get similar effects by using, say, you know, more complex conceptual structures that you know, capture more of what we know about the world. It's or, coming in the know. way the subjects distribute their pennies. Because mm -hmm. if I had a classic attitude Savage type prior, yeah. I put them all on the one I thought was most likely. Mm -hmm. Even if it was only a little bit most likely than mm -hmm. the next one. Mm -hmm. So I'm revealing some sort of non additive 
likelihoods. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing that at least at that point already. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree that's an effective description of, of that behavior in that situation. The question is whether that description maps on to the same kind of type of description I'm, I'm thinking about here. I mean, I think this is fascinating. We should discuss it more, but maybe offline. Yeah. Um, One more question? In a lot of the diversity stuff where people neglect base rates and uh, sample size, can your, uh, can your thing uh, yeah. get people to do that? Yeah, so that's a great question that obviously I, I get a lot. Um, I, I, I have to say something first that I don't know if it'll be satisfying, which is I think the Kahneman and Tversky uh, biases are not a, a natural kind, that they're quite heterogeneous and different ones have fairly different explanations. So something I skipped over is an explanation of anchoring and adjustment, right? And that's an explanation at the process level. We say, look, a resource bounded machine that has the ability to do these sort of you know, stochastic updates isn't going to do that many. It's going to look like a sort of bounded adjustment process. Others, like you know, uh, my opinion, and opinions differ of, of the conjunction fallacy, is that it's basically a pragmatic effect, a lot like some of the apples are red, that you're saying, why the hell would somebody say that she's a feminist and a bank teller? Um, so I guess my answer is the unsatisfying one of, on particular cases, we've thought about it and have explanations, but I don't think that they're all the same explanation. Uh, would you like to quick question, or we can do it uh, during the break? Okay, well, thank you. And, uh...